Wow, I can hear that music. Here we go. It can only mean one thing. We're back on the Cotswold Way. In fact, we're back here at Horton Court. Today, we're making our way through Horton Village, across to Little Sodbury and up to Old Sodbury, which will have extensive views once more across the Scarp and making our way further on. Destination unknown as yet. I will put a map up, so by the time you're watching this, I will know where I've walked to, so there will be a map showing you where the route that we're covering today. So we're back here at Horton Court. Just wanted to recap a little bit of the history, and I'm going to go through all of it again, just to, to re-summary the, the key point about the history at, uh, here at uh, Horton. And uh, got, again, I've got to Richard Sales' book. Thank you, Richard, been a lifesaver and uh, sharing bits of history along this uh, wonderful uh, national trail here in uh, the southern part of England and just to say that the Tudor Gothic court itself was added to the hall around 1520 by Dr William Knight who held the prebend or canonship of Horton and Knight is it and actually he became a really interesting figure in Henry VIII's court because the doctorate was in law and for the first time he became Henry's chief secretary he was an eminent churchman with positions in the cathedrals of Lincoln, Bangor and Salisbury and was such a brilliant diplomat that he was appointed prothontory and sent to Rome in 1527 to negotiate with the Pope for Henry's divorce from Catherine of Aragon. So that really, really placed him as an important position in uh, Henry's court. And uh, of, of course, we all know what happened with uh, Catherine of Aragon. I won't go into that history and bore you with all of that right now. But uh, anyway, the history will be continued here as we go on further to continue our walk to Little Sobbery. Well, I'm going to tell you more about William Tyndall, who we first met when we saw that monument on the top of the hill at North Nibley. So why not join me as we rejoin the Cotswold Way? After leaving Horton Court, the way has a choice. You can follow the quiet lane road round to the uh, village of Horton itself, and we'll have a look at that when we get there. Or you can uh, just jump off the lane and follow the edge of the fort, which we did when we uh, did the uh, last came to Horton Court the last time. So we're just going to follow the lane back to Horton today. I did include some photographs, but I didn't explain properly that uh, just on the uh, the woods on the other side when I did that walk to Hawkesbury remember I said about there was a wedding along the lane there just after leaving Horton Court on the right hand side there are a number of pits in the road or off the road shall I say to the right of the road they look like former gravel pits and in fact there is another one here and they're not gravel pits at all they're actually former fish ponds which would have been used for to what to, to grow and breed fish which would have been used at for food at the court here at Horton. Gorgeous views across the scarp here just above Horton Court on the road towards Horton. In fact the uh, temperature today is about 14 degrees this morning we're just uh, just after nine o'clock and uh, was misty on the drive over I came up on the Roman road the Bath Road the 40, A46 uh, one comes down from from Eve from that direction further north I'm not quite sure where it ends up I think is it somewhere in Derbyshire the A46 um, but yeah, I was coming along that road, it was quite misty and dull, but uh, as soon as I got to Horton Court, the uh, sky cleared and the sun broke through and I managed to take a couple of interesting pictures of the sunlight coming across the, uh, the fields where there was still dew on the grass. Now just entering Horton. And the Cotswold Way continues down here. Quite a significant drop in height here over a short period of time. Also note that uh, this part of the way is where we buddy up with our old friend the Monarch Way so this is another dual route again.
Yes, it's now evident from the uh, longer shadows that we're approaching mid-autumn. I will be revisiting that uh, woodland that I did back in, when was it, July time, um, just to see what that looks like in the autumn time. That'll probably be towards the end of the month, perhaps into early October, when we pick up some more autumnal colours. I'll probably do some other visits around about to get some autumn, but I know the Wye Valley is particularly beautiful. I won't be going to Westonborough Arboretum, everybody goes there just near Tepbury, it, uh, it's beautiful, but uh, it just gets too busy um, and making filming and pieces to camera just not practical really, I need quieter places um, so I won't be doing that one, but I can certainly find some equally beautiful uh, places to pick up the autumn colours for you Today's a lot more pleasant than I thought it would be It's uh, a lot more blue sky It's warmed up a little bit, but not too bad, I think it's about 18 degrees now Very comfortable, perfect walking conditions here on the Cotswold Way Little Sobbury is now about uh, 10 minutes walk away. What we'll do is we'll first of all have a look at the church. Um, there is also a manor house, which I'll tell you about as well. It's a tiny little place, tiny hamlet, but uh, with so much history. And uh, so we'll, we'll explore the church first, and then after that we'll go up and have a look at the fort. And I'll tell you about that before we continue our journey south. Now we've arrived at the little church which is dedicated to St Adeline. It's the only church in England to be dedicated to this particular saint and Richard Sale has got quite a bit to say about Little Sobbury and I would like to, to, to share some of that with you now because I think it's really really interesting. I'll also uh, do a separate piece around the other side of the church to tell you a bit more about William Tyndall who we picked up when we are at North Nibley. Richard says that the church originally stood behind the manor, which we'll go and have a look next, but it was in such a poor state that in 1859 it was demolished. The work was carried out carefully and the stones were used to assist the rebuilding on the present site. I'm not sure if it's open so we'll, we'll go and have a look inside presently. So it's closer to the, uh, the village than the original church was here. The, built, the church was built to the same plan as the original, except it was not given a flat roof, probably why the original one was in such a poor state. The original manor church was dedicated to St Adeline, the patron saint of Flemish weavers. Now this is where it's really interesting and links in with the Cotswolds and the Cotswold Way. If you drive down the A46, you'll notice some strange named places like Petit France and Dunkirk, and those are named well, they come from the Flemish uh, ancestors that came to this part of the Cotswold and of course that was in terms of trading wool. Internally the church is neat but contains little from the time when William Tyndall, more on him in a minute, preached in its original situation. The pulpit is interesting containing five panels with fig figures of Hooper, Latimer, Ridley, Cramer and Tyndall who were all martyred at the time of the Reformation. Just seen noticed inside the church here at uh, Little Sobbury that uh, Little Sobbury itself is a thankful village. There's only a handful of these around. I think there's about five or six in Gloucestershire and South Gloucestershire. It basically means that uh, during the First World War there were six men that uh, left this village to fight on the front and thankfully all six men returned. And I just noticed that one of them was only 14 years old when he went off to fight.
had a little bit of a disappointment at the manor house in Little Sodbury. We're now at Little Sodbury Fort, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the history of the manor house up here. Cat film down there. Sadly, the manor house is currently being completely renovated. Um, it's also a very private site with lots of security around there, lots of uh, earth movers, diggers, noise, bleeps, and all kinds of stuff going on it makes it impossible to film and sorry I couldn't even get close enough to get a shot of the manor house I'll see if I can uh, find an archive one on the web somewhere and insert that roundabout now if I find that just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the little sobbery of manor house while we're up here at the fort the manor has an unremarkable line of lords following the dispossession of Saxon Alward after the Norman conquest until it passed to John Walsh in the late 15th century and that's where things really get interesting he probably fought with Henry Richmond, who later became Henry, King Henry VII at the Battle of Bosworth, thus obtaining the favour of Henry, which assisted his son, Sir John Walsh, to obtain high office. Sir John was twice High Sheriff of Gloucestershire and acted as King's Champion to the coronation of Henry VIII in 1509. Later, he was to host Henry and Anne Boleyn, who stayed for a few days at the manor house in Little Stobbury, probably in the Oriel Room the name given to the room overlooking the seven veil that contains an oriel window. With Sir John's death in 1547, the manor passed to Maurice Walsh one summer day in 1556. When Maurice and seven of his children were sitting at dinner during a severe thunderstorm, a sulphurous globe came into the room, through the open door, transversed it and passed out through a window opposite. One child was killed instantly and four others were so badly injured that they died soon afterwards. By September, Morris was also dead, apparently as a result of the same incident. This sounds like an example of the much discussed boar lightning. Now the manor house used to be open to visitors. Sadly, it is no more. It's been purchased probably, probably by some foreign oligarch billionaire. <laughs> That's what it seems like. That's the impression I get, which is really sad. Uh, a lot of visitors that went to the manor house in Little Sobbery went to see the attic where William Tyndall lived. And I'll just talk to you a little bit more about uh, William Tyndall that we first come across when we saw that fabulous monument up at the top of the scarp, uh, just overlooking the village of North Nibley. Despite his fame, it's not known where or when William Tyndall was born. The Tyndalls are well established in Gloucestershire, with branches at Stinchcombe, North Nibley, Cam and Slimbridge, the latter being the favoured birthplace. All that is known of his date of birth is that it was between 1490 and 1495. This date is arrived at by working backwards from 1515 when he received his MA at Oxford University and he was then ordained. Tyndall then went to Cambridge and was probably present at the public burning of Martin Luther's books following his excommunication in 1520. William Tyndall moved to Little Sobbury Manor in 1521 to join Sir John Walsh's household. It is not clear what precise position he held, probably he acted as tutor to the children. In the latter capacity he used the original St Adeline's Church. I remember that it has been rebuilt since uh, William Tyndall's day because it collapsed probably because it had, you know, had that flat roof. That stood behind the manor house. All that now remains above ground of that church is a doorway and a small section of a wall. Despite Beside the doorway stood still the original yew trees. It seems that Tyndall's life at Little Sodbury was crucial to his eventual life's work. Certainly, by then he had decided that the typical clergyman of the day was more interested in his social position than in promoting the Christian ethic by teaching. This view was supported by the condition of the peasants, many of whom Tyndall must have seen in his walks in the area. For the most part, they were hard-working, but underfed and desperately poor. They were also superstitious, which Tyndall saw as a due to a lack of positive guidance. Tyndall began his translation of the Old Testament at Antwerp in Belgium in 1530 by Miles Coverdale, whom he had already met at Sudley Castle, which we've seen previously on the uh, Cotswold Way. By this time, the climate in England was changing. Henry VIII spoke favourably of him, and by 1534 he was himself being petitioned by the clergy of Canterbury to allow an English Bible. But though times were changing, they did not change fast enough, and in May 1535 Tyndall was betrayed by one Henry Phillips, probably acting on orders from England. Tyndall was imprisoned, charged with heresy, tried and found guilty. 
On the 6th of October 1536, his body was burnt at the stake in the courtyard of the castle of Vilveroid after he had been executioned by strangulation. Just as uh, we're leaving the fort, I'll just tell you a little bit about its history. So it's an Iron Age fort. It's enclosed on three sides by two parallel battlements. And so it's probably built around about 8,000 years ago and similar time scales to the uh, forts we've seen previously here on the Cotswold Way. The Romans also used it. In fact, they reinforced some of the battlements. And then the uh, Saxons, after the Romans, used it as a base as well, and they used it to engage, um, or sorry, to, to strengthen their forces before the Battle of Durham, which uh, we'll go and see later on as we cross through the National Trust uh, Durham Park in a future Cotswold Way here. Just come back down the uh, scarp, although it's not so too steep here as what we've uh, had previously. Might be able to make out in the distance there, well actually say distance, not that far away, is the perpendicular star church of Chipping Sobbury. In fact, indeed, that's the town of Chipping Sobbury over there. One of three Chippings, Chipping meaning marketplace in the Cotswolds. We've got Chipping Sobbury, Chipping Camden, which obviously we're familiar with now, and Chipping Norbert Norton just across the border into Oxfordshire. So we're going to continue our journey along the track there. That's the way, and then we're heading towards Old Sobbury. Tyndale's monument is now way in the distance over there above North Nibley. Might be able to make it out there if you're watching this on a really big TV. I don't know, it's looking really tiny on my viewfinder here now. Good cloud formation today. I was uh, expecting it to be grey and overcast all day, but uh, got those light fluffy clouds which stand out against the blue sky. First time, as far as I'm aware, that the Cotswold Way's actually crossed the churchyard itself. We're now here at Old Sobbury. Now, this is lucky. Got a nice view across the edge of the Cotswolds here, on the edge of the churchyard as well. And there is a perfectly positioned seat, so I'm going to grab that and have a drink. Just on the edge of uh, Old Sobbury village, there is a tunnel, or rather the tunnel runs underneath the Cotswold Escarpment. It's the uh, main line between London Paddington and South Wales. It's the Bristol cut-off line, the one that doesn't go via Bristol straight through to South Wales underneath the Severn Tunnel. And uh, so it goes under the scarp here. It's quite a long tunnel called the Sobbury Railway Tunnel. And it emerges from the tunnel just outside of the village here. I'm not sure whether I'll be able to get a glimpse of that. What you can see from the road in the A46, if you're heading down towards Chipping Sobbury, you can see this, what looks like a castle. And it's a crenellated um, air shaft for Sobbury Tunnel.
I've just seen that um, the Dog Inn in Old Sobbury, we just passed it, read the sign that that uh, was extended and rebuilt for the workers building that uh, railway tunnel two and a half miles long. The first sort of it was cut by the Duke of Beaufort, as I said before, was based at um, uh, Badminton. Sorry, my brain went then. Yeah, Badminton, just over a few miles under. I think the tunnel literally almost goes under the edge of his land. And uh, that was in 1897 and the tunnel was finally opened in 1903, just over two and a half miles long. It's now been electrified and I'm hoping to, when I finish the walk today, I think I might drive over to see if I can get a better shot of that tunnel, or the exit or entrance, depending which way you're coming from, uh, to show you and insert that into the vlog here. So we've now left Old Sobbery, or just left Old Sobbery, just come out of the uh, village, lovely uh, quaint village. Yeah, people there seem really friendly. Several people uh, said hello, good morning to me as I was walking through. I probably guessed I was doing the constant way. I kind of stand out in my hat, boots and rucksack. Looking a bit different to the people just going about their general daily chores here in the village. Um, there is a beautiful Cotswold Manor House in front of me. Oh, I don't know anything about that. I'll just spin the camera around, see if it shows up on the map and I'll tell you some more. But we're gonna head across this field and then we're heading towards Donington Park. Donington Park, I've got some memories about that. I'll tell you more about that in a bit. Yes, Donington Park. I uh, remember going there in the 1970s. Um, it's, it's a country park, country estate, big grand Cotswold house, manor house as you would expect and uh, there was a balloon festival there, balloon festival, oh yeah like it was a country fair there was lots of things going on I remember seem to remember you could also have a helicopter ride I think it was I'm sure it was something like 40 or 50 pounds now if you put that into today's money 40 or 50 pounds back in the 70s I think it was probably the late 70s I don't know what that is I'll put that in below so it was a lot of money I remember it seeming a lot of money then and uh, probably is still quite a bit of money now. Um, yeah, you could have a helicopter ride takes you off around the Cotswolds. Sadly now it's uh, private, although the Cotswold Way, thankfully, private uh, public right of way cuts across Donington Park, so you are still allowed to enter Donington Park. It's now owned by one Sir James Dyson. You'd probably be familiar with that name. He of the vacuum cleaners and cooling fans and all of that, yes. He lives there. I don't know if we'll see him today. Probably not. <laughs> um, his headquarters is just over the way. It's also in the Cotswolds. He's based at Malmesbury town we haven't looked at yet here on West Country Wanderings, but uh, one I'm sure we will do in the future. Uh, that's where his head office is. They used to make the, the vacuum cleaners and all his appliances right here in the Cotswolds, but sadly no more. They are now, I believe, made in Singapore. Uh, but uh, his engineer designers are still based here in the Cotswolds. So yeah, beautifully landscaped park here. It's absolutely stunning. I'm getting the sense here that uh, Mr. Dyson resents the fact that a private, uh, sorry, the public right of way cuts across his land. There's CCTV fences and signs galore saying, keep to the footpath, do not stray off, you're being watched everywhere. So, uh, <laughs> interesting. Just coming up to a bit where the main driveway gets to the house. I can't actually see the house from the park. Uh, we'll insert uh, an archive photograph of it so you get a sense of what it looks like. But the, the park is rather grand very stylish with the trees. Um, I'm not sure who designed the park. I will find out for you. You can just make out top of the house just over there or part of one of the wings should I say. Donington Park as you see it as I've shown on the video here owes much to one Capability Brown. Yes that name keeps cropping up doesn't it? I'm sure we'll come across it. I think we'll come across it again when we do 
Croom just outside uh, Worcester. He landscaped it around 1760 for one Sir William Codrington. He transformed the original part with controlled addition and removal of tree clumps and the digging of lakes. Later, around 1800, the original Tudor house was demolished. Who then, the Christopher Codrington then employed one James Wyatt as architect of the new house, which took 20 years to build. It seems that Wyatt wished to avoid the prevalent Palladian style at the time and produce something simple, even severe, but Codrington demanded some addition to the classical style. The result is a relatively harmonious, though the massive Corinthian columns of the West Front seem a little heavy. I'll try and insert a picture right about now so you can see it. Detailed accounts remain for the house. They show that up to 1811 the building costs was £58,000 and a time when a farm worker could earn £12 a year. Internally the house is a minor treasure house of furniture, paintings and curios. Now sadly it used to be opened to the, to the general public as were the, the gardens and all the grounds but now it's just the Cotswold Way, the uh, right of way which goes right across in one narrow strip. You're not allowed to stray off that at all. Apart from the house, there are museums of coaches and coaching equipment, which I seem to remember from my visit here in the 1970s. Uh, what's happened to those now since James Tyson has bought them? I have no idea, anyone's guess. Uh, and it says the house and gardens are open. Well, sadly they are no more. Anyway, that's all we have here on the Cotswold Way for you today. Next time we will continue from the far end of Donington Park, just over that ridge of that hill, and we will continue our journey south, closer towards the city of Bath. I think we've now got four, yes, four, uh, just four left, four videos left um, until we get to the end. The last one, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna catch the train to Bath from home and catch a bus up to Weston, which is where the, the penultimate Cotswold Way video will finish and then I'll walk in. That'll obviously only be a relatively short journey of a mile and a half or so, but that, what that'll enable me to do is the rest of that final video here on the Cotswold Way, it'll give me a chance to show you around the beautiful architecture, places like the Royal Crescent and the Circus. Anyway, that lies in the future. We're here in the present. I hope you enjoyed the com my company today, guiding you along this portion of the Cotswold Way. Until next time, take care of yourselves, look after yourselves. Hope to see you all again soon. Please consider a subscribe, a like, a share or comment. I'd be very grateful if you could do that. All the best. Take care, bye-bye.